to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present my results. But at the same time, I must apologize a little bit because I'm not completely prepared to give this talk. The results on which uh, it's based are not yet written down. Uh, all that is written down are m some notes which are now in back in Romania and what, what's, in, what's in this slide. Uh, nevertheless, I hope that the result itself will be sufficiently interesting to compensate for deficiencies in presentation. <laughs> okay. So, um, um, well, I'm going to look at the linear Schrodinger equation in um, d dimensions, where d is going to be a number greater than or equal to 3. Mm. And um, if the p if uh, so this equation is a uh, partial differential equation it's um, a dispersive evolution equation and um, uh, we expect the solution to uh, disperse and decay at a rate at uh, roughly t to the minus d over 2 in dimension d so here, the one of the significances, actually the main significance of the fact that d is greater than 3 is that uh, the decay rate, t to the minus d over 2, is uh, consequently going to be integrable at, in, at time infinity. Um, so um, if in this equation we introduce a time-dependent potential, then it is not always clear uh, that the solution disperses. Uh, so w what is clear is that the L2 norm of the solution is conserved, but we can even expect some other, uh, the solution not only to not to decay, but to grow in certain norms. This is because um, if the potential depends with time, first of all, there is this uh, very easy to visualize case of um, the time periodic equation. For the time periodic equation, then um, even if the solution does not have um, bound states in the ordinary sense, uh, this uh, movement of the potential can contribute to create some dynamic bound states for um, for the equation, which are called uh, or maybe called Floquet bound states. Um, so. Um, it is, it is not always clear that the solution disperses. Nevertheless, I want to present a case here, a very general case in which the solution does disperse and we can establish three hertz estimates for the solution. And when I say the solution, I only mean the dispersive part of the solution. So at each moment in time t, um, we, uh, we can, let's just assume that the potential v is a very nice function, it's uh, smooth, uh, maybe even compactly supported, even though it turns out that these conditions are not necessary, then um, minus delta plus V um, has a spectrum that decomposes into a finite number of bound states and the continuous part of the spectrum. Of course, we only expect um, dispersion and decay for the continuous part of the spectrum. There, there can be, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, but my results are more general than that. So first, uh, let's, um, let's see this. Uh, first in dimension three. Uh, in dimension three, let's assume that the potential is, uh, let's, let's say L2 with some decay that actually makes it L1, as uh, I sh uh, wrote there. And the derivative of the potential is um, L b a little bit better than L2 in time and in the same, uh, with the same decay in space. And for now, let's also assume that everything is radial. Uh, then Schichard's estimates hold for the dispersive part of the solution. So. This is a 
much more general result than has been obtained before because I, I'm not assuming that anything about the shape of the potential. The potential can split, can combine, can change shape, it can come back and disperse. Um, it, it is certainly helpful to assume that the potential um, at the successive profiles of the potential at uh, successive times form a pre-compact set in uh, this space. I assume that I um, think that eventually this condition will turn out to be not necessary and we'll, we will be able to replace it with uh, weaker conditions. Uh, by the way, um, this result, uh, um, I have obtained it by myself and I plan to Yes, so it's, L, uh, it's L2 and with a weight uh, which propels it almost to L1, let's say. That's actually, again, that's not strictly necessary, but uh, uh, this is certainly sufficient. Yes. That's, that's exactly what I mean. It's X to the minus three halves with Japanese brackets times an L2 function. And here, um, and you're also assuming radial. I'm also assuming radial, yes. Uh, radiality actually helps and I'm making full use of it. Uh, I, I assume, I think that eventually I'll be able to get rid of the condition that C is radial and for V I'm just going to put some conditions on the um, rotational derivatives of V. So uh, I'm going to assume that V has some high rate of decay in the higher harmonics, but I'm not there yet. And by this projector, I mean the projection on the continuous spectrum of this operator. So now, these results uh, continue to improve in higher dimensions. Uh, for uh, dimension four, one can go, instead of L2 minus epsilon, one can take any um, Lebesgue space except for L infinity, and in dimension five or higher, one can also get L infinity in time, uh, but then the norm the norm of this time derivative has to be small. Um, sure. Uh, by the Schrihardt estimates in in, dim in dimension three, I mean that the solution C belongs to L infinity in time L2 in space intersection with L2 in time, L, and let me be very precise here, 6 comma 2 uh, in space. So this is slightly better than L6 in space. This is the Lorentz space L6 comma 2, which is a slight a logarithmic improvement over L6. Um, okay. So, um, This implies scattering, dispersion, anything. Well, that if you are uh, suggesting a well, that one of the implications uh, of this is that if you know that there is decay, like the one that was already found, so there is decay like oh. that. Um, yeah, I guess that's a good question. Um, no, I don't know about pre implies decay. I think that, yeah, I think that for pointwise decay, I would need to put some condition on the Fourier transforming time of the um, of the potential. And and that's much too strong. Yes, yes, but uh, I, I actually have not searched for that. So, uh, 
All that I'm uh, proving is this sort of weaker sort of decay as shown by Schichard's estimates, which in turn implies uh, scattering. This, this dependence may not be explicit because um, even in the time independent case, it's not explicit. So even in the case in which the potential is constant with respect to time, uh, I don't see a very nice and easy explicit dependence of the constant in the uh, Strihart inequality on the norm of the potential. I, I, I'm going to venture a guess that the dependence is at most exponential. And <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, that's going to be yeah, very easy to prove. But, uh, yes. This has to be short range. Yes, I, I expect to be able to get rid of the radial condition. Um, I'll show exactly how it uh, comes up in the proof in a second. And um, so, yeah, well, I, I'll see. I mean, I don't want to claim anything that I cannot prove today. So then this is all that I'm going to say. Um, why, why is this result still interesting despite the radial limitation and everything? It's because all the previous results that exist concerning time-dependent potentials exist in the regime in which the potential is, let's say, a fixed potential plus a small perturbation that can depend on time. By the way, one can, of course, also uh, add a small perturbation that depends on time to this result because once one has Schichard's estimates, one can bootstrap. So one can add to this uh, small but arbitrarily rough perturbation to the potential. That depends on time. Uh, but um, other than this, all previous results essentially assume that the potential is uh, independent of time. Uh, or in the case of one previous result that I had, uh, I assume that the potential has a shape which is independent of time, but then this shape is subject to translations, rotations, and rescalings. Uh, still, essentially, it's the same profile which is subject to these rigid motions. Well, here, there, there is no rigid motion. The potential can change in an arbitrary manner. And if the dimension is high enough, then it's enough that the change is uh, slow. It's the change is adiabatical. Well, I think uh, uh, so, and the ch this sort of adiabatical change can go on forever and won't affect the result. Okay, and I think this is a new reason. So now let me mention a little bit about a prior result. Um, the first person who analyzed the case of time-dependent potentials is Howland in 1974. But, uh, he proved the existence of the wave operators, but the potential that he considers decays with time, which means that it's essentially zero, zero at infinity, so it doesn't really matter so much. Uh, now, there are these results of Bourgain. Sorry, you, you assume you're, you're the uh, uh, no, the potential is at infinity in time. The potential has absolutely no decay in time. No decay, no, no decay at all. Uh, on, it's only that the change in the potential is slow. That's, right. that's the only condition. If if the, the yeah, 
or even in L infinity if the dimension is fine. Um, and oh, let me still say what this means that this also works for the wave equation. The same proof method works for the wave equation, but uh, I think that the dimension has to be at least one higher. So instead of dimension, let's say greater than or equal to five for adiabatic, uh, adiabatic changes, one has to assume that the dimension is at least six, and so on and so forth. In particular, I don't know if there's any result for dimension three. Um, so there are these results of uh, Bourguin and then Wang and then Fang Zheng uh, for um, uh, compact manifolds in which they show um, some uh, small rate of growth of uh, the Sobolev norms, uh, T to the epsilon in some cases, and then logarithmic growth in uh, some other cases. Um, So uh, logarithmic growth for one in 2008, and then there is a more recent result, of also with logarithmic growth, but the condition on the potential is relaxed from it uh, from the potential requirement requiring required to be analytic to uh, Gervais type any Gervais type condition on the potential. Um, on the other hand. Uh, Bourguin's results only require the potential to be smooth. Um, now, um, this is what one would expect on compact manifolds, and there are other results, like this one, Delors. Uh, there are even more results which I didn't cite, because uh, on, on compact manifolds, one uh, expects uh, norm growth. Uh, and there are several regimes in which this uh, happens. First, there, there are specific examples for which there is norm growth. Um, it's, it's, uh, norm of yes, uh, norm of the so growth of the Sobolev. And then uh, there is a probabilistic regime in which there is uh, a norm growth. And then there are uh, upper bounds on the rate of growth uh, which are, are either polynomial in time, uh, like here with an arbitrary small power of t, or are logarithmic in time. And these logarithmic uh, growth bounds are more recent. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the reason why I don't want to focus on this is that on uh, non-compact manifolds such as R3, one expects the opposite of that. One actually expects the um, a solution to disperse, but uh, as I said, I don't think that this has been proved so far. Uh, and, um, and there is a, a large number of results for uh, time periodic potentials. Um, let's see. There is this result of uh, Galt Bayer, Jensen, and Yajima. Uh, there is this result of Goldberg. Um, then there is this result of Kostin, Leibovitz, and Tanvir. Uh, all these results for um, uh, per for periodic potentials prove um, fir the first one proves pointwise decay. The second and um, the second one proves um, um, the, the young point Schrihart's estimate. The third one proves uh, also a specific pointwise uh, rate of decay, which is not the optimal. Uh, pointwise rate of decay for the free equation. It's uh, something intermediate. It's, um, I think, um, uh, t to the minus um, three over five or something like this. Um, so, in the first case, uh, the first result uh, depends on the absence of resonances, and in the presence of resonances, they get the optimal decay rate of t to the minus one half. The second result depends on the absence of resonances. He, put, uh, he imposes some conditions, Goldberg imposes some conditions that effectively imply that there are no resonances. And in the third result, 
they are able to prove under certain conditions that there are no residents and no bound states. Um, okay. Now, the results which are direct ancestors of today's result are uh, my results in 2011 and my joint result with Professor Sofer also from 2011 um, in which we prove that if the potential keeps a fixed profile but moves subject to translation, rotation, and rescaling, then uh, we have Strihart's estimates for the dispersive part of the solution. And um, in the first, in the first case, um, we we just assumed uh, that uh, the um, derivative of the modulation parameters of the potential is in L1. And in the second case, we relaxed this condition. So we uh, the movement can be uh, more rough. It doesn't require a full derivative. It can have half a derivative in L2. Okay, so here we are getting close to the threshold of Brownian mode. Um, okay, um, now I want to say something about the proof. And here I have only noted a very bare sketch of the proof. Uh, the proof is based on the use of wave operators. Namely, we consider the equation I dt C minus delta C plus V of T C is equal to zero. And we apply uh, omega to C. Let's say, let's call omega of C equal to phi. And by, um, oh here omega is the wave operator. Which wave operator do we use? Well, at each time T, we use the wave operator associated to minus delta plus V of T. Um, so this has the advantage that it turns the equation into simply the um, uh, free wave equation. Uh, but then we get, um, we get a derivative of the wave operator applied to C. So well, here we have another term, um, let's say plus or minus I dt omega, omega inverse phi is equal to zero. Um, so it is nice that we have eliminated the time dependence in the main part of the equation, but now we get this uh, remainder term which we want to bound. Well, uh, we are going to bound it actually using Stichard's estimates, but in order to uh, be able to apply Stichard's estimates, we, want, we need to prove that this term introduces an extra decay in the solution phi. So we want to show something like dt, phi, uh, DT omega, uh, omega inverse maps um, L, uh, let's say L, four to L four thirds, just as an example. Uh, so we want to show that this introduces extra decay. And, and uh, only in this term. And now we want to show that this term is sufficiently small that we can treat it as an error term. So then is that misrepresentation just for small for large time or for any time? Um, uh, this is going to be um, small in a uh, dual Schrichardt. This is what I mean. Yes. Okay. Um, so
So there, there is no way that I could have done this in the original equation, I mean, because first of all, um, th it's not even necessary that V of t has a limit at, as time goes to infinity. So I could not write this as, um, as a, let's say, V infinity plus a small perturbation. This is the whole point. But here, this thing can be small because the time derivative of omega is small. So uh, I want to show that this operator always has this property. And then uh, because the time derivative of omega is small, then um, not only does it improve the Lebesgue space, but it also makes it small. And now to intent. So now that plus smallness uh, solves the problem. So now, uh, I didn't say that the derivative with respect to time of the potential is small because um, I don't actually require it as, as long as, of course, as long as I'm dealing with a Lebesgue space which is not an infinity, I can take an arbitrarily large function and cut it up into many small functions, many smaller functions. Uh, and then if we, piece together the Schrihardt's estimates we get on each of those portions, then um, in, in the end we still get an overall Schrihardt's estimate. It's going to have a, an exponential dependence on the size of this time derivative, but that's okay. It's still going to be fine. Uh, on the other hand, if we deal with L infinity here, uh, then we need small norm because we cannot cut up a, an L infinity function into pieces and make it small. Okay, uh, so so the main point is how do we make uh, how do we gain this um, um, this improvement in decay in uh, the Lebesgue, and this is what I want to say. Yes, that's straightforward. Okay. Yes, uh, because uh, in this particular case. Um, let's see. Actually, um, let me say it's something like this. Let's say here, L3 to L3 half. Uh, then, uh, if I have if I have this uh, gain in decay, uh, then uh, phi itself is in. L4 in time of L3 in space. And um, this takes it to L4 in time of L3 house in space, but this derivative is in L2. So in the end, uh, it is going to take L4 in time L3 in space into L four thirds in time, L um, three house in space. And this is a dual Schrihardt norm. Now we can just run a contraction argument and um, the loop closes as long as um, the norm of this operator is small enough. The omega is the wave operator. Omega of t is the wave operator corresponding to minus delta plus v. So uh, for a fixed t, yes. So uh, omega of t times minus delta, it, it is defined by this is equal to minus delta times omega of t. It has this commutation property. Um, so Uh, omega, uh, automatically, omega applied to uh, the projection on the point spectrum is zero, always. Um, so uh, if we obtain, yeah, I should uh, say how to close the proof here. If we obtain Schrihardt's estimates now, they will apply to this phi here. So we need to reverse them. We need to apply omega inverse to phi. So I'm going to, s uh, but um, Omega only has a partial inverse because it's not a full isometry because of the existence of these bound states. So uh, 
the proper statement is that uh, the continuous projection spectrum of omega is equal to omega inverse of t times phi. So this is why we will only recover uh, these um, Schichardt's estimates for the projection on the continuous spectrum as we were expecting. Um, so we, of course, we also need to know that omega of t and omega inverse of t are uniformly bounded in some appropriate norms. And this is why I stated here that um, um, the potentials V form a pre-compact set in this, um, in this space because uh, if they form a pre-compact set, the norm of the wave operator is a continuous function of the potential. So then a continuous function on a pre-compact set is bounded. And the same is going to be true for omega inverse. So really the main difficulty here is um, is uh, gaining uh, some power of decay in the Sobolev mode. Uh, so I'm not really requiring a uh, hard power of decay. I don't really want to gain one over absolute value of x, but I want to gain the equivalent of that in uh, Lebesgue norms. And um, um, let's uh, see how this happens. So first of all, the reason why we have a chance of doing this is because uh, the wave operator omega is equal to the identity plus some other terms. And those other terms are going to be better than the identity. And once we take the time derivative of the wave operator, the identity drops out and we are left with those better terms. Yes. Uh, so, so far I have, I've, I have actually looked at this before and I didn't think that it was possible because last time the only thing that I could get was um, um, decay in uh, the convolution kernel of the wave operator. Of course, the wave operator is not a convolution operator, but one can still look at it as, as such um, in a certain way. And its convolution kernel had some decay. And this allows one to prove that um, the wave operator is bounded on uh, Sobolev sp spaces and on Lebesgue spaces with weights. But I was not able to uh, actually get the sort of decay that I'm interested in here. So now I, I finally I have been able to do this with the help of this um, spherical symmetry. So first, let's look at the so first term. Uh, yes. Yes, sure. Yeah, uh, no, not without derivatives in the angular direction. Yeah. Uh, so the reason is, uh, just to skip to the end here, the reason is that by integration by parts, I, I gain one over, um, let's say, some coordinate of x to a power of less than one. And then I need to integrate this over all possible directions to actually get a uniform decay in all directions. I mean. If I just have one over x1, say, uh, that's, not, uh, that's not enough uh, decay. But if I integrate one over x1 over all possible directions of the versor u1, then that is sufficient decay. Uh, and if I want to be able to integrate it, uh, then uh, yes, I'd better have some symmetry in the radial direction. Because otherwise, uh, nothing would prevent um, it to concentrate in just one direction and then I cannot integrate. Um, so let's uh, go over this slowly. Um, the first term in um, the expansion of the wave operator is the identity. The next term, um, so that would be the zeroth order term. The first term is the one that's here on the board. Um, it can be thought somehow as as a convolution kernel, even though it's not exactly a convolution kernel, it's a convolution kernel t and some multiplication thrown in as well. This is, by the way, of course, what allows us to get a decay. If it were a convolution kernel, then it would have no decay, of course. Um, and um, 
Uh, so in this sort of thing, if the, we see that we want to get decay in x, or in x plus t omega, which is which is going to be the same thing. Uh, so in order to get decay in x in this expression, we integrate by parts. Um, we get one over x times omega here, um, and at the price of obtaining um, so what happens when, the, so we integrate in parts in S. So what happens when the derivative in S hits the other terms? Either it eliminates this S here, so it's one over S, or it hits this exponential here, so we get a T, or it hits uh, V hat, and uh, we get uh, the derivative of V hat with respect to this. Um, so the derivative of, um, V hat corresponds to uh, V divided by, uh, to V times whatever, V times absolute value of X. Um, yes, uh, I, so I want to prove, I want to prove this sort of mapping as a general statement, which which does not depend on size or time or anything. And then on top of that, I use the fact that the time derivative is small. So first I prove a statement which is uh, independent of, um, of time. Um, okay, so so when uh, the t derivative with respect to S hits V hat, we get V times the absolute value of X. When we get a factor of T, that means we get less decay in, uh, in the convolution kernel, as I said, of, of this wave operator, because T here represents, um, is the variable of the convolution kernel of the wave operator. And uh, when we get one over S, uh, I don't care about that because that's handled by Hardy's inequality. So one over S times V hat is going to be whatever, less than uh, the, the S derivative of V hat. And uh, I, I don't want to make this clear because it's not necessary. So uh, whatever, so this means that in order for this operator to so here we get one over x, that's, uh, that's a gain. And now we have to deal with the results of this integration by parts. So in order for the results of this integration by parts to be manageable, we now want uh, v times the absolute value of x to have the properties uh, that uh, v used to have in my previous argument. So we want v times the absolute value of x to have, uh, to have those properties. And we also want to gain one factor of t because, uh, I mean one factor of one over t because we have to compensate for the loss of a factor of t here. Um, so unfortunately that's not doable because, um, uh, because in the usual course of the proof, we can get all sorts of rates of decay in t between t to the zero and t to the minus two. And if we, get, if, we want to, if we want to handle a factor of, an extra factor of t, that's not just not possible or because t times t to the minus two is t to the minus one, and that's not integral. We want the, the, we want the convolution kernel, of course, to be integral. Um, so we can do this up to a factor of epsilon. Well, there is an epsilon loss here. So we want to integrate by parts, but only up to an epsilon, and then we only lose, I mean, this can be handled by interpolation, and then we only gain here, um, we only gain t to the epsilon, we only lose one over s to the epsilon, and we only uh, take one minus epsilon derivatives in the s variable. Um, so that's, um, that's manageable, and uh, this is the reason why we cannot uh, get the endpoint um, L2 in time here because that would correspond to the endpoint which is not a thing. Um, so given all that and given that the proof works in the previous case, 
after the integration by parts. Now it's still going to work if V times the absolute value of X has some good properties. And those good properties are something like um, L2 with a weight of X to the minus one. Um, X, to, X to the minus one half, more or less. This is why we get X to the minus three halves in there. So X to the minus one half times L2 was sufficient for uh, the existence of the wave operators in the previous proof. And now we have to deal with an extra factor of X here. So it's going to be X to the minus three halves. Um, and uh, we don't actually need X to, X to the minus three halves because uh, as I said, we cannot carry this argument at the end point. We need an epsilon. So uh, that doesn't matter. Um, okay, this is only the first step. Uh, the difficulty here so for even for this first term, by the way, um, we don't gain one over x, we only gain one over x times omega, where omega is uh, some direction on S2. And um, uh, now we have to integrate over all omega in S2 in order to, gain a, to actually gain a power of x of dk. And um, that, uh, that actually happens again. So uh, the integral of one over x times omega to a power of p, um, uh, is um, less than or equal than some constant over x to a power of p. This is actually true uh, as long as p is strictly less than one. When p is equal to one, there is a there is already a logarithmic loss. So once again, a reason why this argument does not carry through at at the end, at the end point. But since there are already so many reasons why the end point doesn't work, this, that no longer matters now. And as long as we are not at the end point, this is actually true. Um, okay, uh, this is only the first term. The next, the uh, terms after that are actually. Um, a bit more difficult, uh, it turns out that instead of dealing with um, the potential V, uh, so there are several ways of writing this expansion. I'm going to choose the one that I prefer and the one that I obtained in the course of my proof of the boundedness of the wave operators. And that um, one has this contribution of V and then ha one has many more such terms coming from uh, which have exactly the same shape, instead of, uh, instead, except that instead of V, we have uh, all sorts of combinations of V times characteristic functions of half spaces. There is no other way of, than of putting that. So it, instead of V, we have V truncated to half spaces. Uh, half spaces, yes. And we have, so actually it turns out that all the other terms in the wave operator have this form except that we replace V with V truncated to half spaces. Of course, uh, um, it's, it's something to do with the structure of the wave operator. That's the way, best way that I can put it. I have found uh, that the characteristic function of a half space interve intervenes in uh, the structure of the wave operator. And uh, this uh, truncation to half space translates into a Hilbert transform in one coordinate on the V hat set. Um, so um, now this, um, um, this Hilbert uh, transform uh, as it is, uh, or this truncation to half space does not preserve the radial character. This is the main thing. So if we could use the radial character for the first term, then all the other terms are not going to be radial, but they are not going to be radial in a symmetric fashion. And this is what saves us because, of course, all the terms have to be symmetric. Even though each individual term is not symmetric, overall their contribution has to be symmetric. Okay, so now I mentioned the word Hilbert transform. Let's see what the Hilbert transform does for us. Um, well, when the Hilbert transform um, uh, applies to the der derivative of v hat, doesn't do anything bad, it just commutes through. And I, as I said, I want to use this derivative of v hat to uh, bound one over s times v hat. 
So um, the fact that we are taking the um, Hilbert transform is uh, is not a loss. The only loss is the fact that we no longer have radiality. Um, so we no longer have radiality for each individual term, but as I said, we still have um, we still have each term reproduced in a spherically symmetric fashion. So, we st so the solution is that we still carry out that computation. Um, in addition to um, to this multiplication by a certain function, we also get um, we also get a translation, and the direction of this translation um, depends on. On the, on the direction that we have fixed before. So we have many terms of this form, and we need to take the spheric their spherical average because each of them is repeated in a spherically symmetric fashion. Uh, and uh, now uh, up to here, um, I have not actually used the fact that uh, the function itself is radially symmetric, but I, uh, I have found it very simple to prove that when the, function, when the function f is radially symmetric, then the spherical average of this sort of thing is, um, has, the re has the required the bag improvement properties. Um, so first, when f is uh, spherically um, symmetric, then the spherical average of this sort of expression over all directions omega is still spherically symmetric. So by duality, in order to prove that it has the required properties, we only need to pair it with radially symmetric functions. And then, um, so we, all that we need to consider is the dot product of the spherical average of one over x times omega uh, to some power which is less than one, let's say one half, uh, f of x plus omega, t omega uh, with um, some radially symmetric function g. And, and now I take the adjoint of this operator and uh, the adjoint of this operator is um, no, I, I'm sorry I, I, I shouldn't try to explain it here it, it, I'm just going to say that uh, this does have the required um, Lebesgue improving properties and Yes, except that uh, thi this no longer goes through the origin. Yes. 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 And um, okay, and therefore, um, so therefore, one can then use the Schichard's inequalities to close the loop. Okay, I probably shouldn't try to uh, do this proof live, so uh, I'm going to end here, and thank you for your attention.